love I need no other coat I'm burning with love My heart's on fire The flame grows higher But I will weather the storm What do I care How much it may store I've got my love to keep Are you sitting comfortably? Well then let's begin. Help Wanted by Timothy Totcher. Santa needs a new reindeer. The first bunch has grown old. Dasher has arthritis and Comet hates the cold. Prancer's sick of staring at Dancer's big behind. And Cupid married Blitzen and Don has lost his mind. Dancer's mad at Vixen for stepping on his toes and Vixen's being thrown out. <laughs> she laughed at Rudolph's nose. Now, if you are a reindeer, we hope you will apply. There's just one tricky part. You must know how to fly. Merry Christmas. around the Christmas tree at the Christmas party hop. Mistletoe hung where you can see and the couple tries to stop. Rocking around the Christmas tree, let the Christmas spirit rain. Later we'll have some pumpkin pie and we'll do some caroling. Boughs of holly Rocking around the Christmas tree Have a happy holiday Everyone's dancing merrily In the new old-fashioned way Rock 
Looking around the Christmas tree Have a happy holiday Everyone's dancing merrily In the new old-fashioned way Looking around the Christmas tree Have a happy holiday Everyone's dancing merrily In the new old-fashioned way You better not shout, you better not pout, I'm telling you why, Santa Claus is coming to town. The Tale of the Christmas Tree Fairy. I'll tell you an old Christmas story as we sit round the log fire at night, where each Christmas tree has a fairy on top and why Santa's beard is so white. It happened one winter in England on a dark Christmas Eve long ago. There was Santa out doing his rounds and playing on the sledge in the snow. He was taking all the presents to the houses and then when that first job was done, he went round once again with his fairies, putting Christmas trees in every one. Now just when he thought he might finish and the last house was almost in sight, he went to fetch more trees off the toboggan and found he was four trees light. This discovery quite upset Santa, so he gave to his reindeer a shout and he sent for his Christmas tree fairy to chastise her for leaving them out. Oh, you're a daft little fairy. You're as daft as a fairy could be. When you packed up the sledge this evening, you must have missed off some of the trees. 
Oh, bugger, replied Little Fairy, which was really quite unfairy-like. I'll have to go back to the factory. And with that, she jumped on her bike. Hold on just a minute, cried Santa. There's a way that won't let you forget. Fetch one tree for each of your fingers on your right hand. You'll get it right yet. Off like a shot went our fairy, much faster than light from the sun, because Einstein hadn't yet been invented, so she wasn't to know it wasn't done. Now if you could have watched Little Fairy, there was trouble to come, you could tell, for when she was counting her fingers, she counted her thumb as well. Now Santa he'd waited for hours, till his patience was quite running dry, till at last he saw the fairy peddling for all she was worth through the sky. But then, as the fairy got nearer, Santa's anger, it grew more and more. He could see from the load she was bearing, she'd fetch five trees, not four. Santa got redder and redder and started roaring with all of his might till the glow from his nose outshone Rudolph and his beard began to turn white. Why, you're stupid, he yelled at the fairy. You're four times as thick as I'd thought. Now go and put the trees in the last houses and as soon as you're finished, report. So straight away off went our fairy and as soon as she'd finished the last place, she brought the last tree back to Santa and waved it in front of his face. Whatever shall I do with this one? Our innocent fairy inquired. So Santa, he upped and he told her, because by now he was feeling quite tired. The fairy, she looked up at Santa and her face, it turned a bit red. But then, like the good little fairy she was, she went and she did as he said. So now at the end of my story, you'll see why to this very night, each Christmas tree has a fairy on top and why Santa's beard is so white.
It was late in the evening when Johnson finished dining at his club. Many of the other members were already celebrating our Saviour's birth, even though that was still two days away. He was just relieved to be out of the courtroom. His employer, the great Arthur Wilbraham KC, had just successfully defended the murderer John Turk to a plea of not guilty due to insanity. It had been the expected result, even though most, if not all, of the court, including a defence team, had thought that he should hang for his heinous crime. Johnson was a young man of 26, and he'd been greatly disturbed by the crime, the way the body had been dismembered and disposed of, plus the sight of the criminal in the dock not six feet away from him, with his tight black hair over his pale white face, not quite grinning. He felt this would trouble him for years. He'd been assured by his employer that these thoughts would fade from memory, and that he should enjoy his break. For Johnson was now free to catch the morning ferry, spend ten wonderful days in Switzerland. Was he really only thirty hours from ski slopes and fresh mountain air? The thought cheered him immensely. He was also grateful to his employer for the loan of a kit bag, as he did not have the opportunity to purchase one. He hoped it would be in his rooms when he got home. He made his way there through the sleet and the rain to Bloomsbury Square, where his rooms were on the top floor of an old gaunt house. Greeted by his landlady, he informed her of his impending holiday, and after receiving the kit bag from her, he made his way upstairs to his fourth floor rooms. He lit a fire in the living room whilst putting his affairs in order, and then put some coffee on to brew. He felt a mixture of warm relief and calmness after the vigours of that courtroom. He looked up as the first bell of St Saviour's struck, but after taking time to count he realised it was already ten o'clock. Thirty hours, he thought to himself. Only thirty hours to go. Now I must pack! And he set about it with gusto. He took the bag to his bedroom. It was a stout, cavernous sack, with eye loops at the top for a padlock, the type that a sailor might use. He'd swallowed everything. Coat, fur cap, gloves, those borrowed skates, his boots, earmuffs, thick socks and all of the warm clothing. Next came the dress suit, but he puzzled how to pack his dress shirts. Some string is what I need, he exclaimed to no one but himself, and went into the kitchen to fetch some. But it was on his way back when he stopped by the linen cupboard. He thought he heard someone on the stairs. Maybe it's my landlady, he thought, with the late post. But as he listened, he heard no more, and concluded that, as there were at least two floors down, there must be one of his neighbours coming in from a night out. Having secured the shirts, he went back to the bedroom, where he had a chance to have a good look at the half-filled bag. It stood in the middle of the floor like an old sack of flour, and really was of poor quality, but dirty and grimy. At that moment, the top sort of lopped over towards him. It fell into a fold that resembled a nose and forehead, with the brass rings just in the correct place for eyes to be. He gave him quite a turn. The horrible image of John Turk flooded back into his mind. He was dumbstruck. After a moment, he forced himself to laugh and admonish himself for being so foolish. But was that footsteps in the empty flat below? He now heard. The hairs on his forearms stood up as he went down the stairs. The door to the flat was open. He went inside, checking every room with the electric light on. Nothing. Empty. He even called to his landlady, but no reply. Satisfied, he returned upstairs and went to drink his coffee. His thoughts returned to his upcoming holiday. In less than 30 hours he'd breathe fresh air, enjoy healthy sport and maybe, just maybe, in the evening dance in the arms of a sweet young lady. It occurred that his field glasses would be of use, and he went to the bedroom and found them on the sill. As he looked out at the sleet fall, he mused to himself how he didn't envy his fellow Londoners their miserable weather for where he was going. Then it struck him. That bag now seemed nearer the door than when he left it. How strange!
He pondered it as he went back to the warm fire, but as he was about to enter the room, from the corner of his eye he saw someone crouching at the top of the stairs, with their hand on the rail. For a split second it stopped him in his tracks. But he turned and there was no one there. He stared at the space for a couple of minutes and again called out, but no reply. He put it down to the courtroom drama. But as he turned round and back into the living room, he heard someone run across the landing into the bedroom. He suddenly went weak in his body. His skin began to crawl with shivers going up and down his spine. As the beads began to form on his forehead, he called again to his landlady. No reply. What was this madness? He grabbed his walking cane and ran into the bedroom. No one was going to better him tonight. He threw open the wardrobe, nothing. He thrust the cane under the bed with the same results and fought with the curtains, but still no one. As he retraced his steps, he stumbled. It was a kick bag again. It had moved even closer to the door. As he turned on the light, he could see something crouching down behind it. Where the courage came from, he did not know, but he moved closer to inspect it with his cane held high. No one, nothing. He glanced inside the bag and saw a crimson stain in a ring of few inches from the top. His mind galloped away. Was this the murderer's bag stained with blood? Where he'd stuffed the body after dismembering it? The howling wind seemed to make a sigh. And at the same time, the bag lurched towards him. In sheer terror, he fell backwards against the door, slamming it shut. At the same time, his cane flicked the light switch. It was now pitch black. Thoughts of horror ran through his mind as he frantically groped for the brass switch. But as he found it, a new idea emerged through the fog of his brain. Maybe he was better off in the darkness. Too late, he switched it back on. His final option would have been better. There, before him, kneeling beside the kit bag, was the murderer, John Turk. Johnson went to scream, but no noise came. And in a few seconds, it seemed an eternity, Turk lifted his forehead and mouthed. It's my bag and I want it. Johnson remembered clawing open the door and then collapsed into a heap on the landing floor. He must have remained unconscious for some time, for when he woke, he was cold, even shivering. As the memories returned to haunt him, he somehow made it to his chair in the living room before passing out. Dawn was breaking as he awoke to find his landlady looking down at him. She scolded him for not being in his bed. Eventually, she said there was a man to see him. Show him up, please, said Johnson, beginning to recover his senses. The gent informed him that the wrong kit bag had been supplied to the horror of his employer and that he was to assist Mr. Johnson to pack the correct one. For some unknown reason, the bag from the trial had previously been sent. Johnson said nothing but just pointed to the bedroom where the man went. He returned about ten minutes later with the old bag under his arm. He seemed to hover in the doorway. Was there something else? Johnson inquired. The other replied that the murderer John Turk had taken his own life last night with poison, but not before writing a last note to Mr. Wilbraham, requesting that he be put to rest in his own bag, the same way as the lady what he had killed. Johnson's skin began to crawl. What time did he die, he asked. The prison warder said it was a St. Tavia's bell told ten o'clock, came the reply. Here's a little West Country Christmas song called The Carol Singers. In our village Christmas time, I says to several mates, 
Look here, lads, I says, says I, now what about some weights? We gets a car, all lungs it up, and on an evening wintry, we muffles up and sallies forth to try it on the gentry. Good King Wences last looked out, thinks we with splendid power. Several neighbours looked out too, to see what all the row were. We sings forte, sounded like an hundred, even in the soft bits how we thundered. John our bass smeared his face, we thought that it were torn. Yet all agree, there were none like we. To wail the happy morn. Phil, he took the treble line, a lovely voice he's got. I were tenor, for John were bass, and Rick were all the lot. He wandered up and down the scale, but still he rather marred it. Because he never knowed no words, and so he lar 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 it. La 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 looked out, sings he with splendid power. Several neighbours looked out too, to see what all the row were. We sings forte, sounding like an hundred, even in the soft bits, how we thundered. Every verse got worse and worse, but though we were all worn, yet all agree there were none like we to wail the happy morn. Still, we never got no cash, which didn't seem quite just. Seen as we'd stood there for hours, a singing fit to bust. Then a policeman, old Bob Bates, comes up a scowling proper. Good old Bob, young Phillips says, at last we've got a copper. Good King Wences last looked out, we still keeps on recording. Bob says, yeah, you look out too, it's seldom I've heard mourning. Then a change came all the situation. Bob got nasty and took us to the station. Look here, Bates, where Christmas waits? We says to him with scorn, he said with a sneer, well wait in here, and I'll be happy morn. The herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. Christ 
Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, who the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. When I was a young turkey, new to the coop, my big brother Tom took me out on the stoop. He sat me down and spoke real slow, and he told me there was something that I just had to know. His look and his tone, I'll always remember when he told me of the horrors of, well, Black November. About August, now listen to me. Each day you'll get six meals, instead of three, and soon you'll be thick. Where once you were thin, and you'll grow a big rubbery thing under your chin. Then one morning, when you're warm in your bed, in comes the farmer's wife to hack off your head. She'll pluck out all your feathers till you're bold and pink, and scoop out your insides and leave you in the sink. Then comes the worst part, he said, not bluffing. She'll spread your hind quarters and pack your bottom with stuffing. For well, the rest of his words were too grim to repeat. I sat on the stoop like a winged piece of meat and decided on the spot that to avoid being cooked, I'd have to lay low to remain overlooked. I began a new diet of nuts and granola, high roughage salads, juice, and Diet Cola, 
And as they ate pancakes, chocolate and crepes, I stayed in my room doing Jane Fonda tapes. I maintained my weight for two pounds and a half. I tried not to notice when the bigger birds laughed. But it was I who was laughing, under my breath, as they chomped and they chewed ever closer to death. And soon enough, when Black November rolled around, I was the last turkey left in the turkey compound. So, now I'm a pet in the farmer's wife's lap. I haven't to worry, so I eat and I nap. She held me today while sewing and humming and smiled at me and said, Christmas is coming. Listen and children listen to hear sleigh bells in the snow. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. With every Christmas card I write May your days be merry and bright And may all your Christmases be one
It was the night before Christmas when all through the house Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse The stockings were hung by the chimney with care In the hopes that St Nicholas soon would be there The children were nestled all snug in their beds While visions of sugar plums danced in their heads And Mama in her kerchief and I am in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter. I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window, I flew like a flash. Tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow. Gave the lustre of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear? But a miniature sleigh with eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver, so lively and quick. I knew in a moment it must be St Nick. 
More rapid than eagles whose courses they came. And he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. On Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly. When they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the courses they flew. With a sleigh full of toys, and St Nicholas too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof. The prancing and pouring of each little hoof. As I drew in my head, and was turned around. Down the chimney St Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot. And his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. And a bundle of toys flung over his back. And he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled. His dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow. And the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of pipe he held tight in his teeth. And the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a round little belly. That shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. With a wink of his eye and a turn of his head. Soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work. And filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose. And giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprung to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle. And away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight. Happy, Happy Christmas, Christmas to all! And to all a good night.